Okay, First John, if you would, make sure. Chapter 4. I'm going to read some things to you tonight. And I want you to look at what I'm reading before we get to the passage. Set in based on your Bible knowledge. These are quotes. I have who said them, and when they said them, and if they've written them, what book they've written them in. Never ever go to the Lord and say, If it be thy will. Don't allow such faith destroying words to be spoken from your mouth. Based on your knowledge of the Word of God, is that biblical? As a matter of fact, the Bible says that when we pray, we should pray in His will. And Jesus in the garden to the Father said, Nevertheless, not my will. I'm sick and tired of hearing about streets of gold in heaven. I don't need gold in heaven. i got to have it now. Next quote. Because it doesn't take brains to figure the thing out. You give to give. There's another one. The Bible warns us clearly that we must not attack a man of God no matter how sinful they may have become or wicked in our eyes. They are. Since you're not supposed to attack somebody because they say they're a preacher no matter how much sin's in their life. Right? That's an interesting thought. Uh, I've got several here. Uh, poverty is from the devil. And that God wants all Christians prosperous. Read that as it sounds. Some of them, the English is not correct, but this is. I, we give quotes. I'm not going to misconstrue a quote because it is a quote. So a big C. When you confess it, you are activating the supernatural forces of God. There's another one. The more you give, the more protection you will have for tomorrow. God will spare you if you sow today. It's almost like buying protection. I'm going to let you know who all of you are. God the Father, ladies and gentlemen, is a person. And He is a triune being by Himself. Separate from the Son and the Holy Ghost. Now that sounds pretty good when you first hear it. But what you've got to go back and listen. Let me read it to you again. I want you to let it. God the Father, ladies and gentlemen, is a person. And He is a triune God by Himself. Separate from the Son and the Holy Ghost. See, God the Father is a person. God the Son is a person. God the Holy Ghost is a person. But each one of them is a triune being by themselves. If I can shock you, and maybe I should, there's nine of them. <laughs> I, I'm not, guys, I, I've got everything documented right here. Here's one I really thought was interesting. I never studied this in Bible college. Adam was a super being when God created him. I don't know whether people know this, but he was the first Superman that ever really ever lived. First of all, the scriptures declare clearly that he had dominion over the fowls of the air. I agree with that. The fish of the sea. Which means he, he is Adam, he used to fly. Of course, how can he have dominion over the birds and not be able to do what they do? The word dominion in the Hebrew clearly declares that if you have dominion over a subject, that you do everything that subject does. However, the Bible teaches us that through Christ we have dominion over sin. Does that mean that we do everything that sin does? It, I, I'm, that's my, I just threw that in there. That's free. In other words, that subject, if it does something you cannot do, you don't have dominion over it. I'll prove this further. Adam not only flew, he flew to space. He was the one with, excuse me, he was with one thought, uh, he would be on the moon. <laughs> Are you ready for some real revelation knowledge? You are God. That's what he says. Are you a child of God? Then you're divine. Are you a child of God? Then you're not human. And then one of the last ones that I thought really bothers me, he says there'll be no sickness for the saints of God. Now I'm telling you this, not because I'm on a witch hunt to try to hurt a preacher or a teacher. Um, I'm telling you this because these are quotes that actually came from sermons, books, and the books have all the page numbers on here of a very popular TV evangelist today. A while back I showed
shared with you that I heard from my own ears, a pastor that spoke, and as I listened to him speak, he said, if two dogs mate, they have a dog, puppies, the dogs. If cows breed, they have cows. If horses breed, they have horses. And he said, I want to I share this with you. He said, God said, let us make man in our image. So when God breathes, what does he create? He creates us. We're gods. And I, I heard it. You can hear it. He said, I want you to say this with me. I am a God. I am a God. These are teachings that did not happen 2,000 years ago. These are teachings that happened in the past 15 months, 12 months, 10, 12 years. Now, I'm, I'm telling you this tonight because there are people who absolutely adore these men and women. And that's not something new. It's something that took place years ago. And God spoke through John, the disciple whom he loved. He says in 1 John chapter 4, he says, Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. Now, the first verse is interesting because this is one of the only times, I think there may be one more in this passage, in which he is speaking in these first three verses, and he uses the word spirit as the identity of the God. And some of your versions, most all of them probably will have, dear friends, or something to that, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the spirit capitalized. In that same verse, he says, you must test them. Them, he is referring to spirits or words to see if the spirit, low caps, comes from God. So what he's painting here in this picture, and we'll kind of get in a little more detail in a little bit, he's painting a picture of people <coughs> who are speaking, and in their speaking, they are saying, I am speaking on behalf of God. And see, I grew up, like many of you grew up, as, you know, and, and you were in church, and you thought that if, if he was a preacher, if she talked, if he talked in a Sunday school class, then what they said had to be right, because, you know, only, only I mean, really, only godly people were going to be teaching, right? I mean, you just, there was just no way that somebody would teach anything wrong, and I believed a lot of what I knew based on what they said. And as I got older, and as I began to kind of step out on my own, there was a lot of things that I began to study in the Bible that I realized were opinions of people that I entrusted and not actually God's Word. And in many cases, it's not necessarily bad things. It's just their personal opinions that they preached as though it was God's Word. And then you get a little further into it, and you realize that there's a lot of people who claim to be of God that if I can be blunt with you, that never have met God. This is not something that is new either. This is something that has been in existence since our creation. And he says here in verse, the latter part, he says, well, there are many false prophets in this world, the latter part of verse 1. And this is how we know if they have the Spirit of God, and he's speaking of the Holy Spirit, if a person who is claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in a real body, that person has the Spirit of God. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. Now let me stop here and say this. We're going to talk about some other things, maybe tonight, maybe next week. This is... John dealing with a group of Christians and in this particular time what they were combating in this teaching was that there were people who believed that Jesus came to this earth but he did not come in flesh. And I think we actually talked about that several months ago. They were teaching that Jesus was a spirit. And that Jesus took on an apparition, uh, a ghostly type body, and you saw him, kind of like the, you know, the, the movies we see, Ghost, or any of those older movies in the 80s, you know, where you saw the person, he was there, or Sixth Sense, and, but you know, you, you could touch him and go right through him. And they said that he took on a, a form, but he was not man. And so he was an apparition, he was a, a ghostly form of God. And 
And the problem with that is if that were true, He could have not died for our sins. And our salvation is dependent upon His death and His resurrection. So they were teaching that Jesus was a ghost and therefore there was no death on the cross because you can't kill a ghost. And so John is saying, listen, if these prophets, he was being specific to that time. They're coming here and they're claiming to be of God, but they're denying that Jesus existed as human, then you don't believe them. But we go further. It says in verse 4, but you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people. Because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Man, that's a, that's a really interesting statement. And what we're going to learn as we study this particular verse here, he, he's saying that with a relationship with the Holy Spirit, and what has happened is we have truly just completely uh, just taken that relationship with the Holy Spirit. We've muddied it up so much, nobody really knows what it means to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. But he says that Holy Spirit, now going back to the New Testament, the Bible says, that I'm, Jesus says, I'm leaving you. But, but don't be, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but don't be really discouraged because even though I'm not going to be here to teach you and to walk with you, I'm going to send the Comforter. And the Bible says that the Comforter will testify of the words of God. And so in John right here, what he's saying is, he's saying you have the Spirit inside of you, and the Holy Spirit testifies of truth. He testifies. So within us, we have the Holy Spirit who can say, wait a minute, what he is saying, something's not right about it. You ever been in a situation, or maybe encountered a, a you know, a conversation, or, or or even an offer, or something like that, and your spirit just didn't feel right about it. And, and you 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 said, okay, you know what? I need to remove myself. Maybe you didn't announce it or publicize it, and, and you said, I just need to remove myself from this. So you removed yourself from this, and maybe things happened that caused discord or problems during that conversation that you were no longer part of. That's the spirit inside of us, and he's confirming God's word. He's confirming what God is doing in our lives. Verse five: Those who belong to this world, so they speak. I'm sorry, verse 4 to the second part. Because the Spirit who lives in you is greater than the Spirit who lives in the world. Those people belong to... What people? Those in the world belong to this world. So they speak from the world's viewpoint. And the world listens to them. Now, this is very... This is, this is almost scary. He's saying that these people who are misleading and these people who are false teachers, they have a congregation of listeners. And those are people who are like-minded. Here's what he's saying. Now, this is where it gets really scary. He's saying that the people who are enthralled by this false teaching have... God, I'm not, I, guys, I'm not writing this. I'm just reading it. They have the same mindset and the mentality of this false teacher, which by the previous two verses means that the Spirit of God is not working in me. God is telling us that we may be challenged and we may be duped from time to time, but we cannot dwell in the presence of false teaching because the Holy Spirit is not going to allow that to happen. <laughs> now that's scary when you think about it. Verse 6. But we belong to God. I'm going to tell you what, that kind of gives me chills right there. We belong to God. I cannot believe that God loves me. I don't know. If you were to ask me, preacher, what, what would be the hardest subject that you would have to preach on Sunday if you were you know, forced to preach on a specific subject? It would honestly have to be the love of God. And I'm serious because I don't know how to explain it accurately. 
this week in a conversation with someone, we were talking about the love of God, and we were talking about the love that we have as parents towards our children, and man, well, how we would really just give our life for our children, no matter what, how horrible the death it would be, we love our children so much, we would do whatever we would have to do to take care of our children, and in the conversation, I was like, man, take that and just magnify it by just an, an unlimited amount of magnifications, and that's how God loves us. That's how, and it says here, he says, but, but God loves us, but we belong to God, and, and those who know God listen to us. He said that believers will listen to what we teach because what we are teaching is godly teaching. Just as the Holy Spirit would tell you something's not right about this lesson here, something's not right about this book here, something's just not clicking, the Holy Spirit will confirm in your heart that when His Word is being taught, this is what you need to listen to. Have you ever been in a, a message or a service or even a song and, and then as the message is being spoken or the lesson is being taught or the song is being sung, there's just like this confirmation in your heart and you're just like, man, this is it. This is right. Wow, this is good stuff. That's the Holy Spirit saying in agreement with the Word of God, this is what we believe in. If they do not belong to God, then they do not listen to us. That is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth and the spirit of deception. Where in the world can somebody get off teaching that Adam flew to the moon? <laughs> or that he flew here? Yes. I mean, you know, every one of us at some point in our lives, every boy, you know, we thought we could fly. I mean, everybody put the towel around your neck and jumped off of something and realized real quick that Superman was just a, a cartoon and not real. We've done that. You know, I thought we could run through walls. And I told you one time before, I thought when I was a younger kid on a four-wheeler, I saw that big bell of hay. I thought I was going to bust through like cartoons. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding, guys. You know, your cartoons, what do you see? You see the guy driving the car and he goes to this bell of hay and hay flies up everywhere and there's a hole that looks just like him, you know, right there. And I thought, I want to do that, man. This is going to be funny. So I'm on that four-wheeler as a kid. I'm going, and back then, I'm just going to be honest with you. Like I told you about my dad. My dad was like, hey, you want to ride a four-wheeler on the helmet? Go right ahead, boy. So I'm riding the four-wheeler. I don't have a helmet or anything on. And I see that thing. My eyes are getting big in my mind. I'm picturing my body image through this. And I go through that thing. And I hit it wide open. And guess what? Cartoons are liars. <laughs> it being that four-wheeler all up, man, I didn't face plant in the side of that thing. It skinned me all up. I'm laying there hoping and praying to God that my friends did not see that. And thanking God I didn't know it then that they didn't have cell phones to record it. Because I promise you, people would have watched it. And I got hurt. I did get hurt because I was stupid. I'm going to be honest. I was stupid. But who, who's gonna who's gonna teach these things? And we be fooled by it. And look at what he says here in the beginning. He says, "Dear friends," do you know what that in, indicates? Who's he talking to? He's talking to the church. And he specifies that in just a few moments. But he says, dear friends, and what we've got to understand, so many times people get the wrong idea about church. They think a teacher or a pastor is being mean or angry or condescending or meddling. But the truth is, when we teach it, we teach it out of love. And, and honestly, like this past Sunday was a very difficult message. It was a hard message. And, and I've talked to several people about it. A lot of men have come to me this week and talked to me about this particular message. And it affected them. And, and it concerned them. And, and we talked about it. And, and it's just really spurred conversation. And I told them, I said, you're going to understand when I preach, I'm preaching to me. And I'm just hoping you will get a little something out of it too. But God is speaking to me. And I'm sharing that. And he says here, my friends, I want you to know what I'm getting ready to tell you, John is saying. It's not to meddle, but it's to help us to be aware of some things that are chipping away at our spirits. The first thing he says, he says, I want to challenge all believers. Here's what he challenges. The church then, and here's what I want to challenge you tonight. Don't believe everyone that says they're of God. I do believe that there are some people that are malicious and evil and their intent is to hurt God's children. I do believe that there are some people, quite honestly, that they are not malicious and their intent is not to hurt. 
but they choose not to study and grow closer in the Word of God, and therefore their ignorance is passed on to others. I believe there's, there's, there's two variations. There's willful intent and there's unwillful. I believe there are people who are trying to harm, and I think people that, I'll be honest with you, in these quotes right here, I believe that this is wrong. Because this man did not get to the prominence and to the notoriety that he's done today. He's not an idiot. He has a lot of homes. He has a lot of finances. He has refused to give interviews in the past. He is not an idiot. He has the opportunity. He has people to do research for him. He has the ability to know what he's doing is not right. And so I believe that in this case there are some people who are trying to be malicious in the way they do things. And John is telling the people that he loves and he just clarified it. He says, don't believe everything you hear. Have you ever met those who believe everything that they're told? And oftentimes they're hungry people. I mean, they're, they're spiritually hungry. They want to see God do something. And they're just searching. But now watch this because a lot of times what I've seen, and this is not 100%, but I've seen this a lot of times, is that the individuals who are really hungry like that, they're, they're looking for someone else to tell them as opposed to them taking the time and the discipline to learn themselves. They want a new word from you and they want a new revelation from you and they want a prophetic speak from you. They want all these things and instead of taking the time to just get into this book, this is, can I tell you something that is just crazy? This is life. I read a lot of books. I love reading. That is one of my favorite things to do. When H and I, when we get out of town this year, I, I've got a read list. I've got two books that are has nothing to do with church, has nothing to do with Christianity. Has no, it's cowboys, okay? It's westerns. <laughs> has nothing to do with anything that's going to help me become a better person. I got two books that I'm going to read on, that have to do with that. And honestly, goodness, I could probably read them in two days or three. And then I've got two books that I want to read that has everything to do with Christianity and the growth of the church. And this right here is going to be the only one that continues throughout the days. Because and I tell you that to say this. The two books that are, are, are about a bounty hunter and westerns and so forth, they're not going to do anything but entertain. And they do entertain. Let me just say that. <laughs> they're easy reads, man. I can read them things in no time at all. They're just easy reads. The two books over here that are about church growth and church era and church life and all these things right here, they're a little more complicated, but you know, really and truly, they're going to give me some ideas and challenge the way I do things, but they're not going to do anything for me. But I want to tell you something. I'm as serious as I can be. I have never spent time in this book and it not do something for me. And there are people that are crying. They're running through the church doors today. And they're saying, God, do something for me. And God is here in His Word. And He wants to do something for us. But we want someone else to do the legwork and share the blessing instead of God speaking directly to us. Be careful, He says. Don't believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. Jeremiah tells us the prophet, the Word of God. I wish I had a hammer here because I'd probably destroy something like I did on that Sunday morning a couple of weeks ago. I, he said that the, the, the Word of God is like a, a hammer. And he said in these false prophecies that look good, they look, they're a rock. Now I like the parallelism because what he's saying is a rock is a hard substance. And it looks solid, and it looks foundation, and it looks strong. But he says the Word of God is like a hammer that when it strikes the rock of false teaching, it shatters it into little bitty pieces. So even what seems like solid teaching, when it's compressed against the Word of God, if it's real, it'll last. If it's not, it'll be shattered. Do you know that John is telling the church this? Because he loves the church. How many people in Waco, Texas called their family and said, something's not right, please get out of this? How many people in the 70s when Pastor Jones decided to leave 
the comfort of the United States and go down south to Guyana, how many family members, how many cousins and sisters and brothers and mothers and fathers and sons and daughters called someone they loved and begged and cried and, and their eyes were just swollen saying, please don't do this. Something's not right. And then to watch in horror as, as airplanes flew over the scene and bodies were laid out, thrown across the field, bloated from the heat and the sun and their, their loved one was dead because of someone's false teaching. How many of those people cried out and said, don't listen to this? They didn't do it because they were meddling. They didn't do it because they were angry or because they didn't want them to succeed. They did it because they loved them. And I'm telling you, I, I love our people at this church and I want our people to know God's Word. And I want you we're going to talk about this probably next week, maybe. Now, I want you to test what I say. Because what I say is, listen, what I say is nothing. Okay? It's nothing. I am more convinced now than ever before that I'm absolutely nothing. I'm serious, guys. He has done, he is so good to me. But what I say is nothing. What he says is everything. So if I get on this tangent and I'm starting to tell you what I feel about something, it's nothing. But His Word is what changes us. It's life. Now, I said that for a reason. Because just like those Westerns won't do anything for me, will not do anything for me. Because they don't have life. See, if the devil can get us out of this book right here, he knows he can get us out of life. See, churches are not, churches are dying not because they don't have nice facilities. We've got the nicest facilities in America than any other country when it comes to churches. They're not dying because they don't have programs. We've got more programs than we've ever had in the history of the church. They're dying because they don't have life. They're zombified. I love you, John says. First thing I want you to do is not believe something just because someone says it. He gives them the next step. First of all, he says, don't believe everything. That's pretty good advice. Second thing he says, I want you to test everything. Test the spirit. The word test here, it means to prove, to examine, to detail, with detail, scrutinize something to see if it's genuine or not. You know what? We have become a generation. If somebody says something and they say it with emphasis and with excitement, then it must be right. I've got family members that they base how good a message is by how excited the preacher was. They won't tell you that, but I see it. I mean, preachers can say, I like peanut butter and jelly. They go, hey, man. <laughs> Just because the way they say it, they get excited about it and they amen it. And I want to tell you something. I've been in churches or I've been in different settings where I preach and other preachers preach and I'll listen to some things and some of the things I hear people say and they just, just crescendo at some point and I hear the amens and all that and I go, are you kidding me? Do you know what he just said really? Because I don't think he knows what he just said. He just said it with a lot of oomph. So John is saying, listen, test these spirits. Make sure that what they are saying has life into it. Make sure it's talking about Jesus. Listen to me. What we have done in the church today is we have taken our attention off the cross of Christ and we have put it on other things. We have trained people in the church today to say, feed me and make me happy. And the messages that are oftentimes delivered are the message that we want people to say, Adam, boy on instead of God saying well done my good and faithful servant. We're more interested in appeasing the people than we are in serving God. And that's a dangerous place to be. He says test the spirits. And by the way, just because I said that don't mean you've got to stop saying amen either. Okay, by the way. Everybody's scared. I noticed, I noticed nobody said a word. People say a word. <laughs> well, you're already on probation, so... And he 
says, why? He says, test the spirits. And then he says, why we should test the spirits? He says, because there are many false prophets in the world. Because there are many that look like, they talk like, they act like, they dress like, that they are of God. But they're not. They're false. They're pretentious. They're, they're not real. That is unbelievable. He says, I want you to test. I want the Holy Spirit to work inside of you so that it's your natural tendency to test what is said, not based on what you feel is right, but based on the Scripture. Test the Scripture. I mean, test the Spirit through the Scripture. And if it's real, and if it focuses on Jesus, then it's right. And if it's not, then you run away screaming. This is not the only warning. In Matthew 7, 15, he says, watch out for false prophets. He gets a little more detail. Jesus does. He says, they look like sheep when they're really wolves. You know what? If we wrote that in 2018, we'd say, watch out for false prophets because they look like church members and Christians, but they're really not. Second Peter says, but there are also false prophets among the people. Just as there will be false prophets among you, teachers. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the Savior, or excuse me, the Sovereign Lord who brought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. And many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories, and their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. You know what he says? He says there are people that are going to teach this right here, and they're going to sound good, and they're going to look good, but all they're doing is fabricating the truth. And you're going to fall in love with what they're saying. But don't think for a moment that God's allowing this to go on without being unpunished. He's saying that the cloud of destruction is over their head, and it's only grace that has not called them into judgment yet. Second Corinthians, for such people are false, deceptive workers, masquerading as teachers or apostles of Christ. And no wonder for Satan, oh, here's the answer. And no wonder for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be the actions that they Excuse me, their end will be what their actions deserve. I'm going to end it here tonight because I want to make sure that we get into next week and not have to go back to life. Here's what he's saying. You know, we, we can go a little deeper in the study, but in the most simple terms, here's what he's saying. He said, I love you. I don't want the enemy to destroy what God's put in you. So don't believe everybody that says they're of God. You test what they say with the Word of God. We'll get into more detail later. But he says, but if the Word of God condones it, then you embrace it. If the Word of God condemns it, then you run from it. And I close with this illustration years ago. My wife was, <coughs> as many people were, little bitty stuff. Bears, what do they call me? Beanie babies, yes. They were gold wrapped in fur. <laughs> she was collecting beanie babies. And so as a husband, there was one that I knew she wanted, and I found it somebody who had, I was only going to talk. It's kind of checking my man card there, but I did it anyway. So I go to this house. And when I go to this house, there was a gentleman there, very nice guy. We started talking and, and just kind of casual conversation, and one thing led to another. We began to talk about God and the Word and so forth. And he, he told me, he said, uh, he said, Pastor, I'm, I'm, he said, I'm a homosexual. What do you think about that? And my answer to any sin question is, is it doesn't matter what I think. I mean, it really doesn't matter. I said, but let's talk about what the Bible says. And uh, so we begin to talk about it. And he told me this. He said, I'm not afraid. He said, you know what? I go to a church. And he said that the staff is homosexual, worship, and 
homeless, uh, you know, leaders of homeless house. He said, when I go in there on Sunday morning, I feel the spirit. And I told him, I said, well, you know, I, I want to say this to you. Because I do, God loves you, man, just like he loves me. He, does, he died on the cross for you just like he does, he did for me. But you, you don't feel God's spirit. Now, you may feel a spirit. And I do believe that because Corinthians tells us that Satan masquerades himself as a spirit of life. So you do feel a spirit, but you do not feel the spirit of God. We had a great conversation. When I see him even today, and that's very rare, but when I see him when I go into another town and so forth, I'll see him, we'll talk and so forth. But man, that was eye-opening to me. Because he had been convinced in his life and in his heart that what he wanted to believe is true. And John is telling his family like we are talking to our family tonight. There is a danger in wanting something to be so true. I mean, wanting something to be true so much that we make the Word of God say it's true. That's the deceptive spirit. Just because someone says it they say God is with it. Don't you believe it until you test it within the Scripture. We're going to go into how we do that, the process of testing. And next week we'll talk about a challenge tonight. Next week we're going to talk about the test process. <coughs> if I could do anything, to get this church to do one thing, it would be to read this book. It really would. Because this book has life in it and it has truth in it. And when I read it, I have life in me. Man, God's been doing some crazy things this weekend. And when I get the opportunity to just share with you how God's been working, I can't wait to do it. And if all those other people are just so excited about what God's doing, but I just stand there amazed. Power of God, sure. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, I have, by my own God admission, I will say this, I have followed things that were not true. Because I like the people who said it. Because they said it with such passion, I wanted to be like them. And Lord, it wasn't until I began to develop a relationship with you through your word that I began to see what was true and what was not true. A lot of things, Lord, I tried to make true to appease my convictions. But the truth lies in the pages of a book that has been persecuted, targeted, mocked. Hundreds of millions of dollars have been invested into disproving it, and it's still here. God, my prayer tonight is that we would be so hungry for the truth that when fiction, false teachings, and lies come before us, that your spirit reminds us of the word, as David said, that's hidden in our hearts. And like a hammer, we can smash it to pieces and never be dissuaded by it. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for bringing our kids back safely. God, thank you for that. Jesus, your name we pray.